Good afternoon and welcome back to the afternoon session here, the first of three this afternoon. Hope that everyone has had a good morning and a good lunch. And we hope that uh, over this next 45 minutes or so that uh, the lunch will uh, not make you too drowsy. I don't want to have to pound my fist on the pulpit very many times to wake everyone up. So please don't make me do that. If I do, remember it will be your fault that I had to do it. <laughs> I think that's what they call passing the buck or passing the blame or sharing the blame. Uh, it is always good to be back in the Ohio Valley. Of course, I haven't lived in the Ohio Valley now for quite some time. Uh, as a matter of fact, long enough that I say Ohio instead of Ohio uh, Valley. Uh, been in the South too long, I reckon. But uh, always good to come back and to be acquainted and reacquainted with people that I've known in the past. Um, yesterday afternoon, Phil Greer was uh, speaking, and he mentioned our association that goes all the way back to uh, Camden Avenue Church in Parkersburg, West Virginia. And he told a story about a short sermon contest at Harding University. I'd like to add two things to what he said. First, Phil. If you were in Mountain Home, Arkansas, and you mentioned my name and short sermon in the same sentence, they would laugh you out of town. <laughs> Secondly, I want to set the record straight and tell you the real short sermon story. Phil had the great distinguished pleasure of getting to hear my first attempt at preaching. Don, I don't think Denver would have even said it was a good effort that time. But uh, we were at Pennsville, Ohio. And Phil had been there already, and he got invited back, and he was generous enough to share with me. And he asked if I would care to go with him, and I'd preach the Sunday night sermon. And I said, I would be glad to. I had a little book of sermon outlines. Some of you probably have it. It was a tan-colored book, Favorite Sermon Outlines, edited by Tom W. Butterfield. Don had some sermon outlines in there. Denver had some. Gene West had some in there. A lot of the folks in the Ohio Valley back in the early 60s had some sermon sermon outlines in that book, and I found an outline that I thought would be perfect for that Sunday night. Spent a lot of time writing out the notes, writing out the passages, the uh, references and all. Well, services started at Pennsville, Ohio at 7.30. They sang probably two songs, had a prayer, had another song. I preached, extended the invitation, sang the invitation song. They served communion to those who weren't there that morning, closing announcements, closing prayer. And at five minutes till eight, the people were saying, wow, we'll get home to see the whole episode of the wild, wonderful, or the wonderful world of Disney tonight. <laughs> so you can imagine how long or how short that real short sermon was. And uh, Phil had the, the great pleasure of getting to hear that effort, whether it was a good effort or not. If you have your Bible with you, it would turn to Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 13. Now behold, two of them, that is, two disciples, were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which has happened there in those days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. 
But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? This passage has long been one of my favorites of all the accounts of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus to the disciples, and not just since it was assigned to me. I know that uh, a lot of speakers like to say that this is my favorite passage only because it, it wasn't until it was assigned to me, but it is now. But it, this has always been one of my favorite ones because of the passage there, the part of it that talks about he expounded in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You know, studying messianic prophecy for most people who are Christians is always one that is fascinating, and most people really enjoy it. They, they love to see the, the fingerprints, or as we might say today, the DNA of Jesus given in the Old Testament as the proof positive of his identity when he appears in the New Testament. And to study those prophecies, and especially with someone who is well-skilled and well-schooled in the prophecies and being able to tie all that together, it's a great study. I know that Brother Gene West taught that course here at the School of Preaching for several years. I have the book that he uh, published or that he wrote as a result of that. And it's a great study in the Messianic prophets. But notice this. Think about the intimate setting that we have two men and Jesus. And the resurrected Jesus is teaching a course, a class, to just two students on all the messianic prophecies of the Bible. The messianic prophecies as expounded by the Messiah. Can you imagine a better Bible class than that one? Can you imagine the excitement that there must have been? As these men themselves said later, after they realized that it was Jesus talking with them, did not our hearts burn within us? As he was explaining to us those scriptures. Our hearts should be burning within us as we just read this account. And then as we notice some of the lessons that we can learn from it. Now, most of this lesson that we're going to be presenting this afternoon is not in the book. So uh, if you want to follow along in the book, that's fine, but you'll probably get lost pretty quickly. The first point I'd like to make is they had a lot of things, but they lacked even more important things. For example, first of all, we're going to notice that they had Christ, but they had Christ without recognition. Verse 16 there says that uh, they did not know that it was Jesus. And their eyes were restrained that they did not know him. Now, since that's in the passive voice, something had restrained their eyes, whether it was a divine restraint or whether it was simply the fact that simply having really not believed in his resurrection, they weren't expecting to see Jesus in this circumstance and at this time. So their eyes, they didn't recognize him because they weren't expecting him. I've met some people this week that I didn't recognize because I hadn't seen them for a long time. They didn't recognize me because they hadn't seen me in a long time. We tend to change over time and out of a certain uh, area or a certain circumstance. But these people didn't recognize Jesus, possibly because there was some divine restraint, but possibly also because they just weren't expecting to see Jesus at this place and time because he had been crucified. And they were not expecting Jesus to be walking along the road as they're traveling to the little town of Emmaus. But as they were conversing with Jesus, isn't it interesting that they began to teach him? They assumed the role of teacher. Of course, Jesus opens the conversation by asking, what is it that you're talking about? The word it says, uh, conversing and reasoning. The word reasoning there sometimes simply means a con conversation. But since it's in co the context of another word, for conversed, this word may indicate that there was an animated conversation going on, something of a debate, a back and forth, a dialogue in the sense that one would say something and the other might disagree with it. And it might have been going something like, well, Jesus could still be the Messiah. 
And Naomi said, no, he can't be the Messiah. The Messiah was going to be a great king, and he's going to deliver us and redeem us from our enemies. We're still under Roman rule, and Jesus is dead. But look at the mighty works that Jesus did, surely. The miracles that he did and the things he did. But still he's dead. And besides that, the law says that cursed is everyone that's hanged on a tree. And so the back and forth dialogue, one arguing one thing, one the other. That may be what is meant by that word reasoning here. They may very well have been arguing. Jesus then interrupts and asks, well, what is this conversation? And they're astounded that anybody who had spent any time recently in Jerusalem wouldn't have been aware of what happened concerning Jesus. I mean, as Paul says over in Acts chapter 22, yes, Acts chapter 22, when he says that this, or chapter 26 rather, this was not done in a corner. Meaning that the things concerning Christianity were out in the open, they were done publicly, they were open to inspection. These things were not done in a corner. The crucifixion of Jesus wasn't done in a corner. It was done very publicly out in the open in front of the, the palace of the governor as they were cr clamoring for him to be crucified. And then as he's taken uh, publicly through the streets of Jerusalem out to the hill of Calvary, and as he is publicly executed with many people, and it would remember it was on a road going in and out of Jerusalem, one of the main roads as people would be traveling, they would see him, many of them seeing him there and just shaking their head wide their heads. So this was not done in a corner. It was done out in the open and publicly. And they're amazed that anybody could have been in Jerusalem for any length of time and not understand or not know what had happened about this Jesus of Nazareth. So they begin to, they, they take the role of teacher. They're instructing Jesus. Isn't it ironic? They didn't recognize Jesus. And so they begin to tell Jesus about Jesus. They're instructing the Messiah about the Messiah. And they say, well, this Jesus of Nazareth, and uh, he's the one who uh, was mighty in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. So this is the conversation, perhaps a heated exchange between them, and then instructing Jesus himself. And as they're talking with Jesus, they reveal their dreams and their frustrations. So first they had Christ without recognition. Secondly, they, well, I didn't know I had that on there. I would have put that up. There we go. They had hope without substance. They didn't have any substance to their hope. The next line there in verse 21 says, We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Well, what kind of hope was it that they had? Usually in the New Testament, the word hope carries with it the idea of a very strong expectation and an anticipation of receiving that which has been promised. It has been mentioned earlier this week in some of the lectures concerning Hebrews chapter 6 that hope is an anchor for the soul. And we sing that song based on that verse, steadfast and sure while the billows roll. But this hope that these people had seemed to be more like wishful thinking. The kind of hope that we express when we go outside on a very dark and cloudy day and it's already starting to sprinkle and we say, I hope it doesn't rain. You know, I hope it doesn't rain. When it's already starting to and you can probably hear the thunder and see some lightning. I hope it doesn't rain. That isn't hope. That's not what the Bible means by hope. And yet the way that these men are using it in this context, they didn't have any substance to their... We were hoping that he was going to be. They had the substance while he was alive, but now that he is dead, they don't have that hope anymore. We were hoping. Notice the past tense. Over in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, remember how the definition of faith goes? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope needs to have some substance. These men, apparently at this point in time at least, at one time they may have had a very, very strong hope, but with the crucifixion of Jesus, that hope has become wishful thinking. Didn't have the substance that it once had. And then secondly, they had a report, but it was without faith. 
Down here in verses 22 through 24, they said that besides all this, today is the third day since all these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. So here they have a report of angels. Andy talked this morning at the 9 o'clock hour about the report of the angels to the shepherds out in the fields. Those shepherds believed that report, didn't they? These women believed the report from the angels, but these men didn't believe the report of the women who had seen the report of the angels. I guess it was maybe once too far removed from them for them to have so much confidence. They go on and said, And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said. But until they saw him, they weren't going to believe it. Him they did not see. So they had a report, but it didn't have any faith. Do you remember over in Hebrews chapter 4, how the writer there says concerning the generation that had perished in the wilderness because of their unbelief? He says, they, that is the gospel, was preached to us as well as to them. Good news. They had good news. Not the same good news that we have, but it was gospel to them. The good news that you don't have to be slaves in Egypt anymore. You can have your own land. You can have the land that I promised to your father Abraham. But when the spies came back with the report, ten of them saying that, yeah, it's a great land, all right. And boy, the produce there is, is huge. But so are the people. And so are the walls of their cities. And the land will swallow up people. And those people are so big we look like grasshoppers. So we can't take that land. Of course, Joshua and Caleb were saying, with God's help we can take the land. God will give us the land. But they decided to listen to the ten instead of the two. And they rebelled against Moses. They were going to choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. That's what good the gospel had done to those people. Their good news didn't do them much good. And they perished. A generation perished there in the desert. Here, the writer of Hebrews is saying that indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Of course, the writer goes on and explains and shows, and the illustration that he's using is pointing to the fact, the application, that neither will our gospel profit us if we don't believe it. And if we don't act on it, we don't obey it. Not being mixed with faith. Those people might have believed what God said about entering the land, but when it came to actually going into the land and taking it, they didn't have that strong of a faith. And so they perished in the wilderness. These men on the road to Emmaus, they didn't have the faith that Jesus is still the Messiah. Crucified, yes, but He's still the Messiah because they didn't believe the report that He had been risen, as the angels had told the women. And so the report, the announcement, the gospel, the good news, didn't profit them a thing. It was as if they had never heard it as far as they were concerned, as far as their thinking was concerned, as far as their lives were concerned to this point. I'm glad that there's more to this account than what we've gone through to this point because to now, to this point, these men would be hopeless, wouldn't they? Not having faith, not having hope, having Christ but not recognizing who He was. But then fourthly, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time, they had the Scriptures, but they didn't understand them. They had the Scriptures. They had the Word of God. They had the Old Testament Scriptures without understanding. Now before I go on with that, I'd like to pause and make a statement, make an observation rather, that, you know, we have the Scriptures also. Sometimes we don't understand them. And sometimes when we're reading through the Old Testament, if we had only the Old Testament... Without the explanation of the New Testament, there's some of those scriptures we probably wouldn't understand very well either. If it weren't for, I believe it was Bruce the other day, was saying, this is that. 
If it weren't for the this is that statements in the New Testament, we probably wouldn't understand some of these references. So before we're too hard on Cleopas and his companion, let's cut them some slack, so to speak. Let's not be too severe on them until we understand that they didn't have all that we have. So really, if we're going to be hard on them, we need to be harder on ourselves. If we're going to uh, talk about how slow of understanding they were, we need to be equally hard on ourselves because we have the explanation that they didn't have until Jesus himself gave it to them. They had the scriptures but without understanding. And then the Bible says that Jesus... From Moses and the prophets explained to them in all the scriptures the things pertaining to himself. So now I'd like to go back to the books of Moses. John chapter 5 and verse 45 through 47, Jesus says there, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you had believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe the things that I am saying to you? Well, where did Moses write about Jesus? And we're not, I'm not even going to attempt to make this exhaustive. It's going to be suggestive. And besides that, Brother Conley is going to be speaking on the rest of Luke chapter 24 tomorrow afternoon. And he might like to have some passages that he can refer to. So I didn't want to take all of them. This is suggestive. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And this is where the Lord God is giving sentence to all those who participated in bringing sin into the world. And he says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He, you shall bru he shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. The seed of the woman. If that was all that we had to go on, how would we know? How much would we know? Thankfully, that's not all we have to go on. Because we can turn over to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. And we can see where Paul says there, When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Born of a woman, Jesus, the seed of the woman. And as others have uh, spoken on the, the virgin birth of Christ, Glenn Hawkins spoke on that uh, Sunday morning in the Bible class hour. The virgin birth of Christ, the virgin conception and birth of Christ. Predicted back here in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. If that's all that we had, it would be pretty shadowy. But of course, we have the other references, Isaiah chapter 7. And then, of course, the fulfillment in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. And then, of course, the testimony of Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. In Exodus chapter 16 and verses 4 and following, we find there where the Lord God is telling the people of Israel, this is where He provides the manna for them. The word manna coming from the Hebrew for what is it? Because they didn't, they'd never seen anything like this before. They didn't know what it was. They went out and they would look at it and they'd pick it up. Well, this was their food. This was their food for the next 40 years or so until they went into the land of Canaan. God provided them this bread from heaven as they called it. Later in the book of Psalms it was called they ate the food of angels. But what is the real bread of heaven? You know, we sing that song, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. And a part of that song says, Feed me till I want no more. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Well, who is the bread of heaven? Of course we know it's Jesus Christ. Because we see down here in uh, John chapter 6 and verse 30 and following, where Jesus, right after He has fed the 5,000 in the first part of John chapter 6, and the next day, he's over in Capernaum on the other side of the lake from where he had uh, fed the, the multitude. And he's in the synagogue of Capernaum. And the people, the next morning, they knew that Jesus hadn't gotten in the boat with his disciples. There hadn't been any other boats there. They were wondering how he got there. He didn't answer their question, we know, because he walked on the, the water to them. But at any rate, 
He's in the, the synagogue of Capernaum. He is teaching them there. They're asking him questions and they're arguing with him in spite of the fact they've just eaten miraculously, not just to where they had just a little piece of food. They had, they, they had eaten until they were satisfied. Now the ladies that are preparing the meals up here for lunch, they're always somewhat concerned because they know preachers. And they know that sometimes it's hard to satisfy a preacher's appetite. How many of us, though, have come away from that meal up there lacking anything? Not satisfied. We eat till we're satisfied, don't we? We're, we had enough. And I'm sure that they had food left over. I know the other day I was talking with Becky Chamberlain. She was kind of concerned about whether they were going to have enough. And I said, I think you're going to have some leftovers. It doesn't look like it's going to be 12 baskets full, but you might have a few leftovers here. They had enough. Well, these people had eaten and were satisfied. They'd had enough. And still they're arguing with Jesus to give them a sign. Well, Moses gave our fathers bread in the wilderness. What sign are you going to show us? Can you feed us for 40 years? I think that's the implication that they're making. Moses fed our whole nation for 40 years. Are you going to do that for us? Jesus says, Moses didn't give the bread from heaven. My father gave you the bread from heaven. And he went on to explain who the bread from heaven is. It's not the manna. It's he himself. I am the true bread of life. I am the bread of life. And he says that about three or four times within that chapter to emphasize the fact that he is the one and the only one who can truly satisfy not the physical appetite, but the spiritual appetite and the spiritual need for every soul of man. And then next, we find in Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, passage where we learn the reason why blood is so important in sacrifice. There, Moses has written, or the Lord through Moses says, The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And of course we understand when we read earlier in the book of Leviticus those first several chapters that describe all the various kinds of sacrifices, all the various uh, times when they were to be offered and the various ways they were to be offered and uh, how the priests were to go about the business of offering those sacrifices. The blood sacrifices. This is the, the bottom line you might say. This is the foundational statement regarding the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given the blood to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. But then we turn over to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. We find there where the writer of Hebrews says that according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins or no remission. And yet, just a short time later, in chapter 10 and verse 1 through 4, he goes on and says, The law, having a shadow of the good things to come, not the very image of those things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, or in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. The blood of bulls and goats don't have that power. They cannot. They don't have that efficacy. They're not efficient to take away sins. Why then did God give them? To prepare the people for a greater sacrifice to come. And if you continue reading all of chapters 9 and 10 of Hebrews, we understand then that it is the blood of Jesus. That blood that is offered not on the mercy seat behind the veil in the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle or temple, but into heaven itself in the very presence of God, in the real of which these physical were the, the types, so to speak. But the true sanctuary, the true tabernacle in heaven, 
And that sacrifice of Jesus was offered once. Once for all. Read chapters 9 and 10 of Hebrews and underline the times where you read the word once or once for all in connection with the sacrifice of Jesus and His blood. Jesus offered Himself once. He is our blood sacrifice. The efficient sacrifice to take away and forgive our sins. The song that we sing, What can wash away my sins? And the refrain, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And how true that is. And then we come down to the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. And there we find where the writer of, of Numbers, Moses, is telling us there concerning an episode in the wilderness where, once again, the people are murmuring and grumbling and complaining about their circumstances and not having meat to eat, not having enough water, not having enough food, and all these various things. So God answers their prayer by giving them the food that they want, but then He also sends them a plague. A plague of what's called fiery serpents. Apparently it was a serpent that the bite of it probably stung tremendously and of course it was also very deadly. And so many people started to die of the, being bitten by these serpents. And so the people come to Moses and they say, pray to the Lord that He will remove this plague from us. God, instead of removing the serpents first, He, he would eventually, but that's not the first thing He did. He told Moses instead, I want you to make a serpent of bronze. And I want you to put it on a pole. And I want you to set it in the middle of the camp. And I want you to instruct the people that if you're bitten by a serpent, if you'll look at this brazen serpent, this brass or bronze serpent, you won't die. Now, human reasoning kind of ended somewhere along the line there, didn't it? If you go out and get bit by a copperhead... I suggest that you go to the hospital as soon as you can. Get to the emergency room, get to the hospital, get it taken care of. Don't try to go to the uh, trouble of building a bronze snake and looking at it so that you can be cured of a copper. Human reasoning is, doesn't enter into this. But this was God's way. And people, when they did that, they didn't die of the snake bite. What does that have to do with Jesus Christ? I would not, on my own, if Numbers chapter 3, or chapter 21 rather, is all that we had, I would never have found Christ in Numbers chapter 21. But I'm thankful that the Gospel of John records for us what this was representing, what this was foreshadowing. Because Jesus Himself says in John chapter 3 and verse 14, And as Moses was lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's one of those passages that's overshadowed by John 3.16. We, we know that verse, but a lot of people don't know verses 14 and 15 that come before it. But it's looking back to Numbers chapter 21, right here with this serpent in the wilderness. Moses wrote concerning Jesus. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 and following, Moses tells the people there that the Lord God will raise up from them a prophet like unto himself. And he adds this qualification. Him shall you hear in all things whatever he shall tell you. And of course we find the fulfillment of that. We spoke of it somewhat last night from Luke chapter 9 and verse 35. At the Mount of Transfiguration where that, shat, that cloud overshadowed Peter, James and John and Jesus and Elijah and Moses. And the voice out of that cloud said, This, referring to Jesus, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him! He is the ultimate spokesperson for God. Because not only did He speak for God, He worked for God, and He also was God, become man, God in the flesh. So these places, and many others, Moses wrote concerning Jesus. And then we come to the prophets. And again, this is going to be representative or just a suggestive uh, list of prophecies. But in Isaiah chapter 9, and I have there verses 1 through 7, but mainly verses 6 and 7. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. 
government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of his government and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and of his kingdom to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Who is this son who is born? Who is this child that is given? Well, if you look at Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, and you see the announcement of Gabriel to Mary, we find there that Gabriel uses language from Isaiah chapter 9. He says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom there will be no end. Language taken almost verbatim from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And then, of course, in chapter 2 and verse 14, we read there where the angels were saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. The peaceable kingdom of the Messiah, of the Christ. Then in Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 22, we find there that the question is asked, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Well, the people of Israel at that point, or Judah rather, at that point in time, needed a physician. They needed a balm. They needed healing. The people of every generation and of every language and of every race and of every geographical place need the healing that only Jesus Christ, the great physician, can give. Luke chapter 4 and verse 23, Jesus says, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard that you have done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. He refers to himself as a physician, or he assumes that they are going to use that proverb toward him. But then later in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 12, remember when he is being criticized for tax collectors and sinners coming to him, sitting down with his disciples, and the Pharisees were saying, why does your teacher eat with these tax collectors and sinners? And John did a really good job a while ago telling us about the tax collectors and how despicable they were in the sight of the common people and especially in the sight of the Pharisees. But here Jesus says, those who are well are not the ones who are seeking a physician or needing a physician, those who are sick. And then he says, you go and learn what this means. And quoting from the prophet Hosea, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, Jesus understood his role. Not only did he heal physically, not only did he heal those lepers, and only one of the ten came back to thank him, he healed many, many people. But that was not the main point of his ministry. The main point of his ministry was to show people that he has the power to heal spiritually. To heal, as we often sing in that song, there is a balm in Gilead. He has the power to heal the sin-sick soul. In Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 23 to 31, there God promises a time when He's going to establish a shepherd over His people. And He is going to be the King. My servant David shall feed them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. It will be a covenant of peace, etc. Down here in Ezekiel chapter 34 promising a shepherd to them. Well, of course, we understand from John chapter 10 and verse 11. You see, when we think of the shepherd, most of us probably go back to Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. But there are a lot of other passages in the Old Testament here in Ezekiel, also in Zechariah, concerning the shepherd, that imagery. So when Jesus in John chapter 10 would make statements like, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. A hireling who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. 
Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. There will be one flock and one shepherd. And Jesus is that shepherd. David, that's spoken of by name back there in Ezekiel chapter 34, of course cannot be the literal David. David, that one, had been dead about 400 years or more before Ezekiel penned those lines. He's talking about what is often called the one called Great David's Greater Son. The one who is the seed of David, the descendant of David. No wonder Matthew starts his gospel account by saying, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. But then in Daniel chapter 7, we find another great prophecy from one of the prophets. The son of man, as he's coming to the ancient of days. This has reference to the, the ascension of Jesus. Coming back to the Father and receiving from him that kingdom. Receiving his throne, as was spoken of back in Isaiah chapter 9 and in Luke chapter 1. And as Peter affirmed on the day of Pentecost, God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Why? Because he is even now sitting at the right hand of God, as he had said in the previous verse. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 64. When Jesus is responding to the high priest who put him under oath to answer us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. It is as you said, nevertheless I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So he is going to come back in like manner. The same way that he went, so also will he come back. But notice Jesus in his self-references most often referred to himself as Son of Man. He did that probably because it was not a widely understood and had not in, in Jewish literature and in their Jewish history and interpretation really been focused on as a messianic title. Christ, of course, they were expecting the Christ. They were expecting, they were, they were expecting a king. They were expecting several things, but Son of Man was more innocuous, you might say to the audience to whom Jesus was speaking, and it wouldn't excite the, the messianic fever among them. And he refers, he uses that expression so many times to refer to himself. But here in Matthew chapter uh, 26, he's using it in its ultimate sense of the Son of Man who was prophesied by Daniel, who went to the Ancient of Days, is also going to come, and he's going to come in power, and he's going to come in great glory on the, on the clouds of heaven. And then in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 17, Jonah, prophet, Successful, as one of the speakers yesterday pointed out, uh, I think it was Roger, pointed out that here Jonah was, he, he had the greatest response, and yet he had the sorriest attitude, going out and sitting over and waiting for the destruction that he hoped would come, but was afraid wouldn't. Well, Jonah, though, in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 17, remember, was swallowed by that great fish that the Lord had prepared after the sailors on the boat had tossed him overboard. Over in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 41, Jesus says there, They said, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah. He also uses this in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 4 and a parallel account in Luke chapter 11 verses 29 to 32. And then we find Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. And of course, we understand from John chapter 19 and verse 37, again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And John wrote that, of course, saying that that's one of the things that was fulfilled when the soldier, the Roman soldier, pierced the side of Jesus. Now, as I said, this list that we've taken this morning, or this afternoon, rather, are just suggestive. And there are many, many others. And I know that Brother Conley will be dealing with probably many others than these tomorrow afternoon when he's speaking on the rest of Luke chapter 24. But what we take away from this is 
Sabbath. Yes, the scriptures. Jesus, as he's walking on the road with these disciples, he is opening their understanding by explaining to them, expounding to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Christ in all the scriptures. How we need as we're reading the Bible. No, we don't need to manufacture places to try to find Christ where He is not because there are enough places where He already is by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But let's make sure that as we're studying and we're comparing Scripture with Scripture and these days with our concordances and things such as that, there's really no excuse for us not to be comparing these New Testament Scriptures with their Old Testament precedents or the Old Testament prophecies with their New Testament fulfillments and realize that Christ is indeed the focus and the center from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And may we thank God and exult in the Scriptures that reveal the Christ to us. Thank you and God bless.